like a lot of companies build something and then think that they can just continue to sell that thing that they built forever. But if you build software, it's a maintenance thing for life. Like for the life of the software, you need to have developers. You need to have people who are keep who are maintaining it, even if they're not adding any new features, even if you're happy with what it does and you don't want to add anything, you still have to update things. Sheldon McGee shares his thoughts on developer productivity and the challenges and benefits of Scrum. Hey everyone, welcome to this episode of the Engineering Leadership Series. My name is Tracy. You can follow me on LinkedIn at Tracy Lee or on Twitter at Lady Lee. And I'm here today with Sheldon. Uh, Sheldon is an engineering manager at Satellite.im. So nice to see you. Hey, thanks. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Yes. And I feel like we've known each other for, I don't know, a lot of years. Yeah, I don't even remember where we met, but it was at some Google thing, right? Like some yeah. Google, you know, I don't know. There's like been so Google many I.O. or yeah, exactly. Probably I Google mean, I.O. Back at back in the day, like I went to every single thing that they ever had. So yeah. Was this like I mean you said you said you took your kids to it. So this was like pre pre second kid? Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, ten years. So at least ten years ago is when we started. I mean, that's when I had a kid to take somewhere. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I went to the stuff before that too. But I mean, even the GDG program's really only been around for ten years, right? Like, yeah. Like they had, they called it GTUG or whatever it was before. Um, but I, I don't think it goes back more than ten years. Google's only twenty years old, right? Oh my gosh, so. that makes me feel. Wait, I is Google know, thirty old? years old? Google was in the nineties. So yeah. maybe it's 30 years old now. I mean, it was at least 1999. So it's yeah. got to be like 20, 20, at least, I mean, 1999 when it like was like probably IPOing, right? So yeah, it's it's older. Yeah, it's but like remembering the pre and post Google times makes you old, right? Like if you yeah. remember what it was like before, um, before we had Google, uh, yeah. like you're just, you're automatically in your 30s and 40s, you know? Yeah. So. I remember uh, printing out those maps from, gosh, I can't even remember which maps service I used. And then I remember when Google came out with this like thing where you could text message a number and it would give you directions, which I thought was so cool. This was like before smartphones, but then, you know, the iPhone came out and it like really changed everything um, with how you travel and just like how you get around and everything. But we digress, although maybe <laughs> not, because we're talking about engineering management today. And, um, you know, you were saying that 10 to 15 years ago, engineering management wasn't a thing. What yeah, does that mean? I, I mean, I, I'm trying to think, I, I mean, even 10 to 15, like I think about how, how did my life as a developer back then, how is it different from developers' lives now, right? Like mm -hmm. back then, I worked at a small company and the owner of the company, like, you know, said, we need this thing. And then I made the thing, you know what I mean? Like whatever mm -hmm. it was, like the, there was no layers of management between me and the guy who wanted the thing that got done. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it was like I mean, so much more artisan. It sounds like, right? Like build yeah, me like, a shoe. Here you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, I, I think a lot of people had an experience like that, like their mm -hmm. job, I, like, unless you worked in big tech or you were at a big company that was specialized in tech, if you worked I mean, we had in, I, I live in Arizona. So like in that area, we had big companies like Motorola and Intel and some other big tech companies, but mm -hmm. most of the people in tech just work for some random small, like they work for a real estate firm like I did, or they work for whatever, you know, mm -hmm. I'm trying to think of other things that are popular back then, but like, yeah, the, the, the landscape has changed a lot for like, for just developers in general, like even small teams have engineering managers now, you know, like right. whereas you wouldn't have had that before. You you know, there's, there's, you know, companies now have big IT departments that are run by lots of people that have infrastructure and blah, blah, blah. And most of that stuff we didn't have before either because yeah. it was just like this one server we put in the closet somewhere, you know? Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, that's kind of interesting because, you know, I'm really passionate about, you know, talking to companies who don't, maybe aren't tech forward, who are trying to get there. And it actually sounds like that's kind of what your job was 10 to 15 years ago, right? Like, 
okay, there's a real estate firm and they, they need, you know, there's this thing called the internet and they need to get on the internet. And so they hire one developer to help them get on the internet. And um, now it's different. You well, know? I mean, now like most, like that's the thing, if you're small enough, you probably outsource your IT needs, right? Like you, mm -hmm. like you probably have some, some company that comes in part-time that handles, you know, even provisioning new computers or whatever, or, you know, like you outsource the, what, what your website getting done. You probably have like small businesses probably have lots of different, you know, they probably have lots of different companies they engage with to handle different pieces of their tech needs. Right. Mm -hmm. So whereas back then, yeah, like I worked at a company and I, not only did I like our company, the, premise of the company was that we were collecting data like we were collecting data from a bunch of apartment complexes and we stored it in a database and then kind of resold that data uh and um and so you know we're, we're we had a lot of people who were like a call center that were calling apartment complexes and gathering data and but we had you know like there's computers and and printers and a network and all that stuff had to be managed <laughs> by somebody. So guess who did it, yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, and, uh, and meanwhile, like since we were selling the data online, we had to control access to that data. We made new, we made reports and blah, blah, blah. And that was sort of the essence of the, the job I had too was, was, you this know, building like out this was like before like a SaaS really software as a service really kind of exploded. Right. Yeah, exactly. Like back, yeah, there was no Salesforce back then. There was none of that, right? Like, I mean, we we were making a choice between should we use Cold Fusion or or Microsoft's ASP, right? Back then, mm -hmm. like, because that's all there was. There was there wasn't a lot of options. You know, there wasn't yeah. even Java back then. There wasn't. Yeah. You know, it was there so much harder. Yeah, I I, it's like harder and easier, right? Like. It, it, it's like when you don't have choices, you just pick one and go. You know. Yeah. Now. Yeah the choice of like, you know, are you going to like, what front end framework are you going to use? What, yeah. you know, like what server tech are you like? It just, it just, there's an unlimited number of choices, you know? Yeah. That is true from like a technology standpoint, having now you have so many choices, you don't know what specifically to choose. But I think also from a company standpoint, right? Like you, I don't know. I mean, just from, from a building standpoint, I mean, I remember the first websites I would build and it hurts that I was like, you know, cutting up a Photoshop file to stick something on the internet, yeah. you know, with drop shadows. I still remember those days. Um, and using like, what was I using to do to like stick that thing on the, like, it was like Adobe. I can't remember which, but it hurt. And now yeah. it's so easy. It's like, I mean, gosh, I remember 2015, like, Material, but you know, you talk about 10 to 15 years ago. That wasn't that long ago. I mean, I've been in tech for 10 years. Like I've been a developer, you know, like I've been technical for 10 years. Um, and um, now I feel really old. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got like 10 years on you. So imagine how I feel. <laughs> yeah. Before that I was doing startup stuff, you know, in tech, but like I wasn't technical. So I still remember my co-founder, my CTO talking about, how, you know, oh, we're just using vanilla JavaScript, a little bit of jQuery here and there, because he wasn't a front end guy. And, um, you know, I never understood those conversations. And then like, later on, I'm like, oh, that's what he meant. Okay, bootstrap. <laughs> now, hell, you know? Yeah. <laughs> no, that's cool that you can look back and n not know those things. And now you're like, now it's just second nature yeah. to you. That's neat. The thing that hurts the most, though, is do you want me to do it the easy way, the heart, like the easy way, the fast way, or do you want me to do it the right way? And the right way will take five days and the fast way will take one day, but there's going to be a lot of technical debt. And I'm like, mm, the one day, you know, cause you don't understand as a, as a business person, what technical debt is until you Right. I actually, I think until you actually are technical, you, you don't actually know what that means, which by the way, let's talk about that. Like, how do you teach somebody what technical debt means? Um, I mean, I think 
it, it's just kind of weird because if you're not in the if you're not in there doing it all the time, the 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 tech debt seems like a uh, it's very abstract, you know, and it feels made up. And, and then sometimes it is made up, you know what I mean? Like, it's like, I mean, we work on an app where like we have a team of mostly developers and QA people. There's never been any pressure from a product manager to do something the, the fast way, right? Like we've never had that pressure in the, the year that we've been working on this, this version of the app. And yet we still have tech debt, right? Like we still, like tech debt got built up not from from the pressures of a timeline like there was also no like yeah we need it we wanted to get something shipped but there was never like there this deadline that it has to be done at this particular time like like the first six months in we need to have this deliverable and then nine months we need to have this deliverable and a year we need it we never had anything like that and yet we still have tech debt so like to me the tech debt thing is it's like I understand it because like I'm also technical too, and I know that like we gotta like we gotta update the version of React we're using. We have to update the version of you know all these different packages that we're using, and if we don't, there could be a security problem or whatever, right? Like whenever tech debt stuff comes up, most of the time the easiest way to explain it is that if we don't do this, we could get hacked, right? Like that seems like the the, the lowest, only driver the, yeah, the lowest common denominator at a yeah. like that's what people understand like if you if you tell them like we need to keep these things updated or else we could get hacked then they kind of understand you know like, it's okay, been okay, beat fine. into everybody's brain yeah. to update your version of windows and it's been <laughs> beat into everybody's brain that you have to maintain your software but that's still a problem right like a lot of companies build something and then think that they can just continue to sell that thing that they built forever but if you build software, it's a maintenance thing for life. Like for the life of the software, you need to have developers. You need to have people who are keep who are maintaining it, even if they're not adding any new features. Even if you're happy with what it does and you don't want to add anything, you still have to update things. You know, new new you know the web kills cookies or something, and so you have to change how you're yeah, you know, like managing guys cookies. get deprecated and yeah think, like yeah. stuff's always changing even if it's a web app like most web stuff has worked for the past 20 years and you haven't had to change anything if you made it a long time ago but on the back end it's not true at all right like servers change the versions of php get deprecated and you're always there's always something coming up where you have to change things you have to maintain things and that i think that's one thing that's difficult for more business minded people to understand is yeah. that you have to, you're constantly like, you always have to be working on it. If you're not constantly working on it, like, uh, bad things will happen. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> you're going to get in a bad spot. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes it's hard to bridge the gap between business objectives and tech implementation, and it can get messy. This dot is trusted by top names like Meta, Google, and T-Mobile, and they love helping business leaders fulfill their strategic digital initiatives. Check them out at thisdot.co. One more time, that's T-H-I-S-D-O-T dot C-O. I remember uh, we were working with um, a client who hadn't updated, and since they had the application built, and when we went in there, it was because there was a lot of deprecation about to happen and it needed to be updated otherwise you know and this, their entire business is built on this and uh, when we went in there uh, it was basically cheaper to rewrite the thing for them uh, than it was to upgrade and update everything because they were so, you know I mean you're talking about like seven plus years of just not updating anything ever so um, yeah, that, that I think that happens a lot too, right? Like imagine imagine starting a React project, you know, five years ago and then not updating your version of React for five years. Like things have changed 20 times over. Like you wouldn't, you know what I mean? Like they, they've changed, like React's changed the way you pass data from one component to another like five times, you know? Yeah. Every year they have a new idea about how to do that, you know? So like the you know, the landscape for that stuff, you know, again, you got to, you either have to keep up with it or you have to just decide you don't care about that piece mm -hmm. of the puzzle, you know, and, and maybe rewriting your app 
or rewriting like this piece of functionality at a, at a small business, maybe it makes sense to just redo that every five years, you know, and it doesn't make sense to keep someone on staff at, you know, you know, it's a, it's pretty expensive to keep developers around, you know? Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's all just, it's, it's difficult to say what the right answer is. It's, you know, it kind of depends on the situation. Yeah. Well, before we continue, I wanted to take a second to thank our sponsor, This Dot, which is uh, my company. We are a consultancy focused on helping companies with all the digital transformation efforts. So we love helping companies who don't have technical staff and just like need help figuring out what the strategy is going forward. And I used to hate that word. Like, do you like that word, Sheldon? Strategy? Digital transformation. Digital transformation. It. It seems weird to, that we're even talking about that stuff still, but, but, I, but it's true. Like everybody's yeah. still going through it, you know, or I guess modernization is like another, another buzzword. Well, right. Like they might've, mo they might've moder modernized in 2005 and now it's, there's just a lot more available now. You yeah. Know? So yeah. Like, I can't even imagine modernizing 2000, 2005, but yeah. Um, yeah, we love doing that. So we, we help, companies like Stripe, Zero, Wikimedia, DocuSign, Twilio, and a lot of other companies that you probably have never heard of um, that, you know, again, are, are kind of like looking for partners to to help with their efforts like this. Um, so anyways, check us out at this.co. That's T-H-I-S-D-O-T dot C-O. Um, so another topic I want to bring up, but before we run out of time, is uh is scrum going away i don't know if it's going away <laughs> uh, actually whenever i make a joke about scrum i always say that like i don't like scrum unless someone's hiring and they want someone to do it the scrum way in that case then i love scrum uh, <laughs> uh, that's that's sort of my yeah but like it's like i kind of understand a need for scrum maybe if you have a really young team and there's really there's no discipline and like they just need some kind of structure and you're, you know, you're a business person like trying to put something together and you don't really like, you don't know, you like, you don't have any, any idea how to do it. It seems like a good idea to go with Scrum, but if you have more experienced developers, it's and like a know process that need, you can fall into because if you don't understand technology, you need some sort of framework to be able to manage a team. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so I could see there's some, you know, there could be some use cases where it could come in handy. Like it's not, it's not all bad. And, and definitely the agile manifesto manifesto or whatever. And the, the ideas behind scrum all are sound, right? Like people before process and, you know, I don't know. I just wanted to go look up what the manifesto said before I started uh, talking about it. But, uh -huh. but yeah, like, it's like those those things are yeah that's all good stuff but but scrum turned into process before people and like if you ask me like process is the most important part of scrum and it seems like with scrum you're basically trying to optimize for you're trying to optimize for predictability right you're trying to optimize for like uh, we're going to get x number of stuff done and we're going to be able to launch this feature at some time in the future and by using Scrum, you're supposed to be able to predict that. And so if you're if you're trying to if if being predictable is the most important thing, then Scrum might be a good way to do that. But if you're if you want to take full advantage of all the resources that you have and all these really smart and talented developers, uh, then putting then using Scrum just really slows them down and uh, and you know, like people spend a lot more time on process stuff and and meetings and whatever else instead of writing software. You know, so it just you know, what do you optimize for? And it, like, I mean, I also kind of get the another big thing with Scrum is like, you might be going slower, but at least you're doing the right thing, right? Like you're working on the correct problem because you've spent so much time like put planning what what the pro like what you should be working on so like even though your team might be going slower at least the thing they're working on is important so i i can kind of see you know that's also sort of the benefit of scrum is that if you're slowing everything down then you really have to focus on the stuff that matters or else you're, you're not going to get anything done mm. what do you think about scrum do you are you like <laughs> pro 
I, I think mean, everything's I, like agile ish or scrum ish, you know, like there's definitely some benefits, but we're, we kind of, you know, just thought we kind of like do what I guess, I guess we're prioritizing people over process, but still understanding the necessity for process. Um, you know, it depends on what our clients want as well, but typically speaking, um, you know, we, you know, everybody though is right. Like everybody is agile ish or like scrum ish. It's like, you're taking the best practices from something and making it yours. Uh, if you're truly leading engineering management and you don't have somebody just kind of trying to push process on you specifically. Right. Um, right. because yeah, it can't, it can slow you down. And I think that's an interesting take too. Like, yeah, if you're just kind of bogged down by all this stuff and these meetings and these processes, then you do have to be way more intentional about what you're working on because you're spending 50% of your time, what, evaluating what you're working on. Right. Yeah. Pointing like, oh my God, the pointing meetings have got to be the worst. But like to <laughs> me, that's, that's the thing about Scrum that is like, to me, Scrum like lays out what you have to do. Like there's no Scrum-ish right? Like you're either scrum or you're not like you're either doing those meetings and following that process. Well, you can like do a few of the meetings and yeah. then not do a few of the, that's what I mean by scrum ish, you know? So, okay. Well, what, okay. So what parts of the scrum, I, I mean, like one thing I like about, about, about the scrum process was that I loved having the daily meeting. I liked having a yeah. meeting where everybody comes in and says, Hey, this is what I did yesterday. This is what I'm working on today. Yeah. And, yeah. and they, you know, Strum is big on, well, what are your blockers? And then yeah. blockers is those another like, yeah, well, blockers is like one of those things. Like if you wait until this, the, the, the morning of the meeting to tell, so, to tell everybody what the blockers are, like you waited too long. Like yeah. if something was blocking you, you should, we should have taken action to stop that. But that's why the scrum the is good because there are so many people who don't and who wait till the meeting, but would you have ever found out if you didn't have the meeting? Well, yeah, that's exactly. Like that's to me as a manager, the reason why the meeting so valuable is because you can hear, like you can hear in someone's voice if they know what they're working on and they're confident about what they're doing. You can hear like they might not know that they have a blocker, but you can hear they have something wrong mm. by what they say, but it's not necessarily about asking, do you have anything that's blocking you? It's more about like the, the, uh, as a leader, you can, you could just tell something's going on and you Ooh. need to dig in a little bit more. I and like maybe that not actually. On call. I like that because, you know, part of the skirmish, like depending on, you know, we work on so many projects, it depends on the project, but some, you know, some daily updates we do in Slack, but you're saying, you know, you can tell a lot by the person's voice. And so I never thought about that as why that meeting in person is so important. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the reason I, I, I mean, for us, it's also like, we don't have that many meetings and like, we need some time to hear each other's voices anyway. We're all remote. Right. So like, right. to me, it's also important just for interpersonal yeah, stuff. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, hey, yeah. like we I usually start the day with saying hi to everybody and asking how things were or whatever. Right. At least like as people are joining. And then, you know, I'm pretty strict about like at two minutes after the the meeting starts, like we get down to business and start doing updates or whatever. Yeah. But but like but but yeah, it's just a time to hear people's voices. Like we don't, don't even usually do video, but at least we're on voice and you can hear like you can just hear uh, that someone's struggling and you can ask questions in the moment, right? Like if someone just types out, I'm working on feature X from blah, blah, blah board. And that's all they say, like, okay, great. You know, but I usually might follow up with, you know, just some question. I usually have a question about something. I could, I can ask anybody a question about what they're working on. Mm -hmm, if, mm -hmm. if, if, if need be, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So uh, like, I'm, I'm pretty good at like, spotting when someone's struggling even when they don't know they're struggling you know yeah 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 so are you pro scrum then i mean you talk about it like kind of falling out of favor but well I, i'm i'm pro like i like you're, the you're daily, pro, you're pro all I like daily meetings i like daily meetings i like i mean maybe not daily i i could be convinced to do it only a few times a week if that mm -hmm. depending on the team but i like daily meetings i like asking people to think about what they did 
before and what they're working on today. Like the, the fact that you have to talk at this meeting and say something, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, like that's an important part. Like that's a part of regular, that's like a part of being productive, right? Like if like all of the productivity books all say, or they, they always talk about how the, the night before you go to bed, you should think about the three things you want to accomplish tomorrow. And you should get to work on those three things in the morning before anybody else is up. You know, like there's, it's always like that, you know, so think about the three things you want to get done. And so to me, like people that I want people to think about, like, what's the thing they're trying to accomplish today? And that meeting is that opportunity, you know? That's good accountability, but I, you yeah. know, it's funny because, you know, you, you, you go through phases in your life of advice and I needed that advice just now. What are the three things I'm going to accomplish tomorrow is how I should be like going to bed. So <laughs> do that. Well, yeah, if you write down, like it, it's, it's in, I see it all the time. Like, cause I, like when you're, you know, when you transition into engineering management, you want to learn how to be a better manager and you have to, you, how are you going to manage other people if you can't even manage your own time and your own yeah. stuff? So like, it's good to, have those little productivity tips or whatever. It's like you have your own scrum for yourself. And it's like I know I'm supposed. I know I should think about the three things I should do, and I know that it's there, but I haven't really got gotten to executing on those. I I usually do it weekly, where I'm like, hey, what do I want to get done for the next yeah. week? Yeah, yeah. Um, but I think daily, well, I could be. I probably would be more productive if I thought about those three things and then honestly got right to work on it. Right? Like sometimes you get in this trap where you sit down to work. Someone messaged you, met, sent you a message on Discord. So then you yeah. go reply to that. And now you're in a conversation about yeah. some other thing. And, and, and work just gets away from you. It's like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. The next thing you know, that, that goal you had yeah. is just not going to happen. Oh my gosh. This is actually a really inspiring meeting for me because I also lead the marketing team and I'm putting them in a scrum, a daily scrum, because, you know, we kind of, it's a like very fluid work, but my gosh, we would be so much more effective if we just did a scrum and focused on, you know, hey, what's the, what's the, what's the top, whatever you're working on to, or well, what so are the top three things you want to accomplish? Well, that that's why to me, it's important to, to, for me that like the daily meeting is good, but I don't think that's scrum to me. Scrum is the, the, like, you know, having a backlog of work and mm -hmm. having, uh, points for each one of the items that you're working on and having retrospectives after the, the sprint and having sprints, right? Like to me, scrum is all of those things having yeah. like sprints don't have to be two weeks, but they generally are two weeks. Uh, uh, backlog, you know, grooming meetings yeah. and all that other stuff. To me, that's all a part of scrum. What like, do you, what do you think of like, um, doing releases on a, on a daily basis. I, I think like, I, like if your team is mature enough to do that and you have a, you're testing your, like you have automated tests for your app where to me, that's the dream, right? Like that you, mm -hmm. you make a pull request against main, you change some code, that pull request gets tested like thoroughly by your own, um, by your own system as soon as that gets merged in go release it you know like mm -hmm. that's the dream yeah like i think there's a little bit of overhead in releases like right like we hit ours we have a a packaged executable that is our release so like i think in our case releasing like that's not necessarily productive because it would also mean that every person you know who's using the app would also get an alert that they have to update right right and like that just i mean even in chrome like i have Chrome right here telling me I need to do an update and it's kind of annoying even how often Chrome does it. So like if we did that every day and multiple times a day to individual users, that would be horrible. So like from that perspective, I wouldn't want to release all the time. But if we had, if it was a website, you know, like Facebook or, you know, like the, the, it, the if the, if that, if your app was a place where, you know, those releases didn't get in the way of people's day to day, then totally would want that to happen as often as possible, you know? Well, Sheldon, this was fun to chat. Um, where do we find you? Uh, I think I'm on, I'm just at two shell on, on Twitter. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to call it X ever. Um, <laughs> I'm uh, also on mass like I'm on Fostodon. So I'm on the, my, Fostodon, whatever. 
I try that out and I, it's just so confusing, but I still go check it, check it for updates. And also even on blue sky, I'm on, I'm two shell on blue sky too. Okay, cool. So I'm two shell everywhere. And plus, you know, just you know, my email address is out there. I'm two shell on GitHub. So yeah. You can find me on GitHub too. Okay, cool. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, this was a fun conversation and um, thanks everyone for listening. We'll see you next time. Thanks everyone. Bye. Before we get back to our conversation, we wanted to say thank you to This.Labs, who is the sponsor of today's show. If you need help with a project that has failed to deliver on time or are in need of a team that feels true ownership over your engineering projects, definitely hit up This.Labs. They specialize in helping business leaders ensure their strategic digital initiatives stay on track. Trusted by companies like PlayStation, Capital One, Herman Miller, PayPal, and T-Mobile, you can find them at This.Co. That's T-H-I-S-D-O-T dot C-O. Now, let's return to our show.